The BBC recently ran a story about a woman in Japan named Asako. When she gave birth to her daughter, Megumi, her husband divorced her and completely excised himself out of their lives. Megumi grew up without her father being around, and this didn't even pose a problem until Megumi was about 10 years old. Asako noticed a change in her personality. She was quiet. She was withdrawn. She refused to go to school, and she wouldn't talk to her mother. Two things were happening. Megumi blamed herself for her parents' divorce, and she was also being bullied at school because she didn't have a father. Sadly, this is not uncommon in Japan, and single parents are often stigmatized. Asako's heart broke for her child. She thought to herself, what if I found a man who was nice and kind, someone who could be an ideal father for her? His presence may just turn things around. So, as unorthodox as it sounds, she did just that. She rented Yamada, a man to be her child's fake father. Yamada had been rented out as a businessman, a boyfriend, a friend, and even a groom at five fake weddings. But to Megumi, he is dad. She has no idea that the person who comes to her school, who sometimes plays with her, and she sees occasionally, is not her real father. His first responsibility when he got this role was to talk to Megumi and apologize for disappearing and to listen to all that she wanted to tell him. After Megumi began to bond with Yamada, her mood turned around. She wanted to go to school again and she became visibly happier. Asako even found herself falling in love with this man because he is so kind and so caring this man who doesn't really exist. Asako has vowed to keep this from Megumi and even plans for Yamada to be at Megumi's wedding. And if Megumi has a child, Asako wants Yamada to be the grandfather to it. It's a heartbreaking story. One in which one's wants and needs are projected onto another person a person who may never exist as such. Why do I tell you this story today? Today is the last day of the church's liturgical year. Today is our equivalent of New Year's Eve. Today we mark the end of the season after Pentecost, and next Sunday we celebrate the beginning of Advent. New Year's has historically been a time of resolutions. It is about assessing our lives in a sincere manner and facing what is true head on, seeking to make it better. There's much that the church would benefit from facing head on. Over the centuries, we have been complicit in the oppression of people. We have been the colonizers who stole land from those who came before us. The church has subjugated women and LGBT persons. We have not cared well enough for children and vulnerable adults. We have turned our back on the environment. We have promoted racism, ableism, and favored the economic elite. I don't mean that the church is doing all of these things right now, nor is this an exhaustive list. In many ways, the church is trying to change and to make amends no matter how slowly. But we cannot move beyond these things if we don't recognize them and reflect on them. The driving factor in most of these problems is that we have failed to listen to the message of Jesus truthfully. We have turned him into an idol with our own ideas, used him for our own agenda, often because we get skittish about what he actually says. Today, then, is the perfect day to share this story about Asako, Megumi, and Yamada. Today is the perfect day to talk about how to unmake Jesus from our images. 
at least in the Episcopal Church, this Sunday is officially the last Sunday after Pentecost, according to the Book of Common Prayer. Historically, there's actually been a lot of confusion around this, about what this day is supposed to be called, so much so that the general ordination exam, the test that priests take before they're ordained, used to invariably ask the question, when is the feast of Christ the King? Most people would answer with, the, uh, with what they thought was the obvious answer. It's the last Sunday of the church year. Eh, wrong. The correct answer is there is no such feast in the prayer book. But over the last several decades, it has become more popular to celebrate Christ the King and the reign of Christ on this last Sunday in Pentecost. Even, that, so, even though it is still technically unofficial, it is our no feast feast. When Jesus appears before Pilate in today's gospel, Pilate wants to get at the core of who this Jesus person thinks he is. He asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? To which Jesus is evasive. He replies, do you ask this on your own? Or did others tell you about me? Jesus has defied Pilate. He hasn't told us who he is. Pilate tries a different tactic. What have you done? Again, Jesus dodges the question, saying, my kingdom is not from this world. Aha, I am sure Pilate's thinking here. He said, kingdom, I've got him. So are you a king, Pilate asks. But sneaky, sneaky Jesus. He says, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Jesus has not given Pilate what he wants, quite the contrary. Pilate wanted something particular. Rather, Jesus presents him with the idea of truth, a truth of God that is so much bigger than any single person, including Jesus. It should be pointed out at this point that Jesus is not a very good king. In modern times, whenever we speak about him as a king, we have to qualify it. Jesus is a shepherd king. Jesus is a servant king. King can't stand alone. Jesus doesn't wear fancy regalia or eat elaborate feasts. As soon as people in the Byzantine period started depicting Jesus as king without modification, he became off limits. He was so far removed. Kings and queens were appointed by popes and patriarchs. They called upon Jesus, the king, and found in him their own divine right to rule their realms however they saw fit. The historian Jaroslav Pelikan sees the order flowing like this. It went from God to Christ, from Christ to the apostle Peter, from Peter to his successors on the throne of Peter, and from them to the emperors and the kings. Do you see how removed God and Jesus are in this picture? To make matters worse, this Jesus was an authoritarian and a seat of judgment. It's no wonder that people during this period felt alienated from Jesus and turned to Mary, his mother, to be their intermediary. After all, she was fully human, and it is a safe bet that she was a better listener than the kings and queens and the popes of Europe. It benefits some for Jesus to be a king because it means that God is on the side of the ruling elite. When a king went into battle, they knew that Christ the king was on their side. When rulers tortured and killed innocents, God was on their side. People were using a fake rental Jesus to fill a void that made them feel whole in what they were doing. But projecting kingship onto Jesus usurps his true identity as savior and lover of the world. I want to present you with an alternative. A few years ago, an evangelical megachurch based in Seattle ran a campaign in which their slogan was, Jesus is, and then a blank. It was on billboards, it was on buses, it was on bumper stickers, and they even managed to eke out a book by the same title. 
For me, there was only one problem. They didn't put their name on any of their advertisements. So I looked at the billboard that said, Jesus is blank, and I honestly thought it was a campaign by an atheist group trying to get the goad of the few Christians in Seattle. I mean, my theory made sense. Jesus is blank. Nada, nothing, zip, zilch, empty space. Turns out, though, the church's idea was that you would fill in the blank with something that represented Jesus to you. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is God. Jesus is friend. If you've seen the movie Dogma, and this is dating myself, Jesus is buddy. Or Jesus is king. But I actually find my original understanding much more interesting and actually deeply Christian. Jesus, God, Christ, is blank. In the 16th century, the mystic St. John of the Cross wrote a book called The Ascent of Mount Carmel. It depicts the saint climbing this mountain in search for God. When he gets to the top of the mountain, St. John of the Cross declares, nada, 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 nada. And even on the top of the mountain, nada. For John, in his native Spanish, God was nada, nothing. Or if I place the emphasis differently, no thing. God is no thing. The very nature of God's being defies all of the many terms and titles or notions that humans would like to press onto God. And this is exactly what Jesus is getting at in the book of Revelation when he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of the Greek alphabet. God is outside of all time and space. God is nothing that be can be contained, so God is all in all. There is absolutely no place you can go to be apart from God. Richard Rohr has preferred to call this feast the pattern of Christ. It is Christ, the Logos, that spoke and the universe broke forth. And it is from this point that everything was connected. From this singular place, all of creation began to unfold according to the pattern of the Christ that upholds it. From that moment, all was connected to God. God made God's presence known 13.8 billion years ago, roughly. This was the point of the Big Bang, in which all matter went exploding out to make the cosmos. And perfectly enough, this is known as the Alpha Point. And there will come a time, science tells us, that the universe will stop expanding outward and collapse in on itself, an Omega Point. The great no thing is that God is who is and who was and who is to come. God is here right now. We don't need to wait for some distant time when a terrible judge will return to set things right. God is anywhere and everywhere we go. God, the Alpha and the Omega is in constant pursuit to love all that is in the universe. It's already happening. Jesus is blank, nada, nothing, frees God up from our own myopic visions. It enables God to be on the side of the oppressed when oppressors seek to keep them down. It enables God to be on the side of the unhoused when those safe in large houses shut down their camps. It enables God to be on the side of the hungry or the sick each and every time they are denied food and medicine. And it frees us from looking at labels like conservative, liberal, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, and countless others so that we can recognize that our entire life is dependent on each other. Today we celebrate our no feast for our no king who is no thing. It is the perfect time to strip off all the layers that we impose upon Jesus and instead seek to serve and love the group of no bodies that Jesus has liberated to be the body of Christ in the world.